see the Noth for today, it may be hard to believe that not very long ago, demolition was its most likely fate. This is the story of a remarkable rescue, following the fort's glory days in the reign of Queen Victoria to a newfound glory in the 21st century. The Noth Fort was originally built between 1860 and 1872. It was a stupendous feat of Victorian engineering, combining enormous structural strength with imposing architecture. As an engineer it fascinated me because in the Victorian era the Victorians were not, they, they didn't separate art from architecture, from engineering and construction. It, it was all merged as one and, and they were all, uh, they all complemented each other and you can see that in this fort. I mean it's, it's functional, very very strong structurally, uh, but it is also artistic. Um, the, the, the way the stones were carved and shaped and uh, it was made to look right and to look good and, and substantial. It was designed as part of the network of defences protecting the entrance to Portland Harbour against the threat of an attack from France. For 75 years, the Noth Fort would be occupied continuously by the military, constantly adapting to rapid changes in gun technology, from the muzzle loaders of the 18th century to the breech loaders and rapid firing anti-aircraft guns of the 20th. After World War II, the military continued to occupy the fort on a small scale as a radar post. But in 1959, they left for good selling it to the Weymouth and Malcolm Regis Borough Council. As it turned out, the council had no idea what to do with it. Unoccupied, and with nobody to maintain it, the fort began to deteriorate, and it soon became a magnet for local teenagers and even squatters. The, the military had sold the fort, as they had with all the other forts around the south coast, to the various local authorities concerned. Now, the local authority here uh, didn't have the resources to, to look after it in, in any real way, and all they did is just lock the door and walked away from it. And uh, so it was very easily breached, uh, there was no security. So, in a, in a very short time, it was um, occupied by um, various people. For instance, there were uh, flower people and uh, various other... Uh, <laughs> Uh, set, sets of uh, individuals who, uh, who came here and who, who um, resided here. Of course, every lad in the town uh, who was worth his salt uh, was a challenge to whether they could climb the walls and get in. There were three main ways to get in. The easiest way was someone used to smash the padlock off and everyone could walk in. That wasn't really favoured with a lot because that meant anyone could get in. So there was a very narrow opening above the gate where we used to climb in, or one of the eight buildings you could clamber up over and go through one of the rifle turrets. Uh, I'm not quite sure what they call the slots there. That had been moved slightly, and I think from the outside it looked like it was intact, but in fact it could be moved, and we, we used to get in that way. The fault was very dark, yes, and um, we must have been quite brave and we trusted the people that knew it and they would just like guide us in, hold hands and um, then we'd go through various underground passages and then we'd settle in what we called our room and then we'd have candles then, sometimes. In the early years, one of the big problems was to keep these, uh, these villains out of the fort who had been here for years and uh, it was quite remarkable what it, we did all sorts of things to keep them out but uh, one of the fine places of entry that they had was that there, were, there was a, uh, an armoured electrical cable that ran up the outside walls of the fort, uh, looking out onto the Portland Harbour side. And uh, they used to, to go, come along on the, on the rocks below and then shin up this cable, use it to, to come right up and come into the fort through on the, on the far side, on Casemate 26. We, uh, we, we actually saw some people in here one day, couldn't figure out how they got in, 
and uh, but we spied them going down the cable on the side on the side of the fort. So this was we hadn't realised that this was a new way in. And eventually, after the Torrey Canyon disaster, the council made a real serious good attempt at closing all the entrances, which uh, they did. So the only way was in was up and down the sea cable. But um, it was very dangerous, really, extremely dangerous looking at it. Uh, and um, there were even girls climbing up this uh, some, sometimes. But uh, one day in particular, I was in here and my girlfriend came. Um, it's probably 17 at the time, I would have thought. And, uh, I'd, I'd climbed in, I'd been in here for quite a while and uh, she made herself aware and, uh, well, I, I was aware of the fact that she was there and, and she tried to climb up. She got about two thirds of the way up and got stuck. And so there was just, uh, there was just no way she was going to go up or down. It was just as dangerous to attempt either. So um, I had to try and find a rope somewhere. Well, I found a rope very quickly actually. Uh, so I had to fix it up and climb out again and run round to uh, where she was, uh, stuck on the rock face, and uh, climb up behind her and uh, hold her feet to the wall and, uh, and manage to help her back down again with no problem. It was a running battle to keep them out. Um, when we arrived, of course, the, the main gate was covered in barbed wire at the top and all sorts of things. Uh, <laughs> and apparently they, they, they had to have come up here practically several times a, a, a week to sort of r repair the the, the defences. <laughs> now and again they called us out. <laughs> yes, yes. You sort of have a peep, nobody inside, and then suddenly they, they'd wait for us all to come out and then they'd appear from nowhere. They wouldn't just jump on the first one out because they knew the rest would scarper. Yep. But mostly, although we felt it was grossly unfair because <laughs> we was like two of the youngest, we'd get taken home. But the blokes were just giving the caution or saying you shouldn't be up here. And um, they'd go on their own way, but it always seemed to be, you know, they're picking on us. <laughs> I was with a gang already coming in here, and Debbie and some of her friends started coming up here, probably not realising we were still here. Um, I think one thing led to another, and we started hanging around together. And uh, obviously we were just friends. Uh, we had a police raid one day when by this time we were all outside of the no fort in the grounds and obviously the police, police cars are uh, cruising up and down obviously to see who was in the area so I told Debbie I said quick get hold of my arm let's look like a court and couple best chat of mine the, ever the police, it does sound uh, <laughs> old fashioned but the police looked, took one look at us and went on for these unofficial occupiers the fort was like a home from home its dark underground passages and lonely atmosphere only added to its appeal. Well, it was totally overgrown and derelict. But it was somewhere that we used to spend time just meeting up. Um, it was a place to get away from parents <laughs> and authority. <laughs> so, but it was, it was dark, dingy, cold, really exciting. For many years, there had been rumours of the fort being haunted. And there were certainly some occurrences that weren't easy to explain away. The very first time when we were coming in here, uh, as n nine, ten-year-olds, uh, a friend of mine from the military barracks up the road, his dad was in the military, we, uh, we were coming in here with a dog and uh, on, on the passages on the side of the fort and as we were coming through a window, the dog started making a very, very strange howling noise and there was a whistling sound. And, and the fact that the dog was so frightened made us frightened, of course. So I think there was two of us, maybe three. And we all just looked at each other and scrambled from the window. <laughs> it was a scramble to get out. We were really frightened to death. So we called that the Whistler's Alley. We did hear some things that none of us could actually explain. It's like supernatural kind of things. And as we talked about it amongst ourselves, we used to scare each other even more which made it more real. But we did hear whistling, as in the whistling gunner, but it wasn't like the sound that you hear downstairs. It was um, a lot quieter, a lot more solemn. And we used to hear talking and, and chattering, and there was nobody else around. So, and that was very, very exciting. <laughs> I know people have said it's, it's haunted. Well, 
might not one for ghosts, but I can, un I can understand people getting that sensation because it really is uh, rather weird and you're here totally on your own, which, you know, there weren't any labels or notices up describing what was this. I mean, there were notices about shell store number six and things like that, but nothing, and an engine room, but um, nothing else to explain what was what. So it, it fired the imagination and made me certainly want to find out more about the place. It was becoming increasingly clear that something would need to be done about the fort. Either it would have to be demolished or some other use for it would have to be found. All the woodwork, pretty well, pretty well all the woodwork had been uh, damaged or burnt. The, um, the various uh, railings and things had been broken uh, and, and there was a huge amount of um, wild uh, bramble bushes and things like this growing up all over the place because it, the place had been left since 1955 or so right through to the, the late 70s. Some fairly improbable schemes were put forward by the council. One involved turning the entire North Peninsula into a hovercraft terminal. Another proposed turning the fort into a luxury hotel. One of the schemes that was decided on was that um, it could be made into a hotel and uh, a firm came along and because of the building regulations that were then in place uh, something had to be started before they could uh, progress in, into the intricacies of planning etc. And so a, a, a small dwarf wall was built in the, in the courtyard really just at random it appeared, it didn't appear to link anything but it, it was there as a as a symbol that they that the building work had started. Then a group of local volunteers realized that the real future of the Noth lay in its past as a site of special historical interest and importance. The idea was that we would take uh, small parties uh, again we were constrained by insurance reasons for taking say 10 people maximum and we would uh, let them in through the, the door in, 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 ten, in ten people, take their 20 Ps and then just give them about a five to ten minute little chat in a, in a group of, of the general history of the place and then take them up this rampart slope and show them the views around the place and uh, just a, a leisurely walk around where, where you had to be very careful because there were holes in the floor and there were lack of railings and all sorts of things. But soon the project grew more ambitious with the aim of restoring this key piece of British history to its former glory and the Weymouth Civic Society stepped in to help. Well the general aim um, was to restore the place uh, for the benefit of the public and to open it to the public. It was open to the public at the time we, we appeared um, on a basis of conducted tours. Uh, I think they were charging 50 pence a conducted tour. And a lot of the tour, uh, it was entirely conducted because a lot of it was over planks and things. Health and safety would be horrified these days, I think. <laughs> With labor provided by the Manpower Services Commission and a small team of dedicated volunteers, more and more of the fort was made safe and gradually opened up to the public. Windows and doors were replaced and rooms filled with models and displays as the fort took on a new role as the Museum of Coastal Defence, welcoming up to 50,000 visitors every year. But in some ways, work had barely begun. Exposed as it was to the battering of the elements, the very core of the fort was in trouble metal was rusting and water was getting in. A campaign was launched to raise the money that would be required, more than two and a half million pounds. Thanks to the Heritage Lottery Fund and other funding agencies, the money was eventually found and the massive task of conservation began in earnest. The challenge was to carry out the work without closing the fort to visitors and for the best part of 18 months Large areas of the fort disappeared from view, swathed in plastic, with scaffolding and covered walkways to protect the visitors. 
But when the Ford finally emerged, it did so to a bright new future. Not just as a site of enormous historical relevance in itself, but as a venue for activities of every kind. From education, to reenactors of the fort's past, to modern drama and modern music. And of course, the fort's walls still echo to the sound of cannon.